welcome you this morning. And, and uh, you know, every so often at Harvester, what, what we do is we try to connect the teaching that we do uh, by books or by topic. And every so often we leave a spot in there, maybe to preach about something that we are passionate about or something that's been in our minds. And one book that's been in my mind to preach about is uh, the book of Ruth. It's a small book, only four chapters long, right after Judges in the Old Testament, that gets overlooked so many times. I don't know how many of you have heard a message on the book of Ruth, but I can guarantee you I can count very few throughout my lifetime, and I've been attending church a long time. Um, But uh, the reason why is because I believe that this book has the ability to tell us a story that God is interweaving within the stories of other people. Now, uh, one of the things that I want you to know is that there are some things that tend to hide God in our lives. One of those things is just hardship and tragedy and bitterness. And so if you have ever experienced, you know, any of those things, you probably were tempted to ask the question, where is God in all this? It's like, God, I don't see you during this time in my life. And, and what happens is that that bitterness has the temptation in your life to really pull you apart or away from God. And in the book of Ruth, I believe, is here to tell us that even during moments of bitterness and tragedy and chaos, God is working, you know, behind it. When I think about the word bitter, all I can think about is when I was little, I used to uh, love drinking chocolate milk. And so my mom would buy these jars with chocolate milk mix, mixture, and then you just, you know, you just pour it into the milk, you know, two or three or four spoons full, right? And uh, I remember I always put three, and then the fourth one, I would just like barely dip it into the milk and then just like eat it like that. You know, that's why if you ever see a picture of me when I was little, you'll understand why I love chocolate milk. When, you know, you'll understand that I, I did love it. But one time, I remember my mom wasn't home, and we ran out of the chocolate milk mix. And so what I found is I found this cocoa powder. And I'm like, how bad can it be, right? It, there's cocoa powder and chocolate milk mix. And so I just put one, two, three, and I take the fourth one, and I dip it barely into the milk, and I take a bite full. I, all I remember is this, like, completely overpowering yuckiness, bitterness just in your mouth, right? And, and, and that's, I think, how we experience life most of the time. It's like we live in the day in and day out. We live in the everyday. And so when something comes at you that's bitter, you just get overpowered by it. And maybe another way to describe it is with what is called some macro shots. So I'm going to show you some pictures, and I just want you to try to guess what they are, okay? Here's the first one. And what do you think this picture is? And some of you may be thinking it's a cell or it's like a supernova explosion, right? Or a flower. Here's what, they, what it is. They're carrots. Just plain, plain carrots. Now let's go to the next one. What is that? Is it a sponge? Is it soil? Is it something else? You've used one of these all the probably many times throughout your life. It is uh, the tip of a marker, right? The last one. And like, what is that? And you, this is my favorite one because you probably had some this morning, or most of us did. It's just a coffee bean, right? So whenever we look at it up close, whenever we look at something, you know, up close, it's even hard to tell what it is. And so what you need to do is you need to, you know, just kind of elevate a little bit or separate yourself from that for a moment so you can see a bigger picture. The problem is that we live in the up close. Your Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday are lived in the up close. The book of Ruth is an invitation for us to see what God is doing. And so the book of Ruth is going to tell you how to see God when he has been hidden by tragedy and chaos. Even during the times of chaos in your life, even during the times of tragedy, God is working and he's being faithful. And the reason why it's important to see his faithfulness, even during bitter times, even during, during times that are hard, is because when we see his faithfulness, then we can know that we can also be faithful to him and to others. Now, how many of you have read the book of Ruth before? Just raise your hand. So some of you. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're actually going to read the book of Ruth. And for that, I'm going to invite a few people that I asked beforehand to help me with this. 
So if you guys want to come up here. So today when you go back to work or talk to your mom and dad and they say, hey, what do you do at church? You can say, we read an entire book of the Bible today, okay? So you can brag about that. But here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something that's been done actually throughout the centuries. Did you know that throughout the centuries, scripture reading has been used as just for, you know, part of the teaching of God's church. And so let me introduce to you, you know, the people that we have here. We have Erica over here. She's going to be our narrator. And then we have Miss Veronica, and she's going to have the role of Naomi. And then we have Miss Kristen over here, and she's going to be Ruth. And then we have James over here, and he's going to be Boaz. Everybody say Boaz. Boaz. Okay, so he's going to be Boaz. And, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to read this book. We're gonna, you can listen to it. Now, you can follow along. This is the, out of the NIV version. So if you don't have a Bible, by the way, I want to remind everybody, in the back as you came in, we have Bibles. If you don't own one, if you don't have one, take that one with you. It's our gift to you. Uh, also, if you have a smart device, download the Bible app. You just go to, to whatever uh, app store you have, download the Bible app. I always encourage people, carry God's Word with you everywhere you go. So here we go. We're going to read this uh, book, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it. So let's get started. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Machlon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab to live there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. After they had lived there for about ten years, both Machlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them both goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, Ruth, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. All right, so the story of Ruth occurred during the time of the judges. Uh, the time of the judges happened right after Joshua, Moses, and then Joshua, you know, were the leaders of the people of Israel. And the Bible says that after Joshua and all of the elders of the people at that time died, you know, there was another time 
a, a turbulent time, to say the least, a time where people didn't know, you know, what was right and what was wrong. In fact, in, in Judges 21, 25, you know, it says that in those days Israel had no king, no leaders, really, no, no one specifically, and everyone did as they saw fit. So there was chaos. There was evil, this, these cycles of evil where the nation of Israel will separate from God and then, you know, tragedy or something, you know, would strike them and then they would try to come back to God and God would rescue them through a judge. And it was just a time of turbulence and evil and chaos in Israel. And during this time, part of that chaos was a famine that happened on the land. Now, to give you an idea of where, where this is taking place, if you can picture Israel on a map, you know, right uh, by the Mediterranean Sea, you know, just right east of it, across the Jordan River, which runs uh, north to south, is the land that's now Jordan, the country of Jordan. Well, this was the land of Moab back then. And so what happens is that this family that we just heard about, Elimelech and Naomi, and their two sons, they live in Bethlehem. And now that sounds familiar, right? Bethlehem, where eventually David was going to be born and, and Jesus. Well, this Bethlehem is called, the name means house of bread. So here's how chaotic things are, that even in the house of bread, <laughs> excuse me, even the house of bread is breadless. There is no food in this, you know, city where, or this town where it, there was supposed to always be bread, um, that it was a, just a farming, you know, village. And so they decide to leave. Now, interestingly enough, they go to the land of Moab. Now, Moab was a land that was considered to be enemies of Israel. And so the Moabite women, in fact, at some point in Numbers, uh, it is said that they kind of just entice the men of Israel to commit sexual immorality and idolatry. And so the people of Israel did not like the Moabites, and the Moabites did not like the people of Israel. So here's how Naomi's story goes, right? They decide to leave the place where God had them, the land, their land, and they go to Moab. And as they are there, tragedy strikes and Naomi's husband dies. Now, on top of that, their sons, her sons, marry Moabite women. And 10 years later, they also die. And there's that famine now has extended all the way to the region of Moab. So they find, she finds herself without her husband, without her sons, with two Moabite daughters-in-law, daughter, daughters-in-law and now, you know, struggling to make ends meet. And so she decides to go back. And as they go back, she tells, you know, the... the their two, uh, her two daughters-in-law, go back to your family. Why? Because she knows that they will not be welcomed in Israel, right? It's like, what future is there for women who belong to a country, a nation that, you know, Israel does not like? So she's like, go back. But Ruth atypically decides to simply cling to her and says, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And shows this little bit of faithfulness. And so, so what we see is we see that this woman goes back to Israel, and this is, you know, small talk town, right? As soon as Naomi shows up, everybody starts talking. There's Naomi that left us to go be with the Moabites, the traitor Naomi, and, you know, her husband has died. And, and she's so afflicted that she's like, don't call me Naomi. Her name, by the way, Naomi means pleasant. It's like, don't call me pleasant anymore. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. So Naomi, we, here we find a lady that has better because of the circumstances of her life. And I don't know if you can relate, but, you know, definitely can relate to some of those, right? Sometimes life doesn't go the way that we want it to go. Sometimes life doesn't end up fulfilling all the expectations that we have. And here's Naomi. But somehow Ruth clings to her, and they are back in the land of Israel. And... And we see that God is going to start doing something, even through the tragedy, and showing them kindness and faithfulness to both of them. So let's see what happens next. Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entering a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? 
the overseer replied. She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean it and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. and She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? I've been told about you and what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. It's mealtime now. Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all that she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves, and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up, and do not rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about 30 pounds. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much that she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over, and she had not eaten. Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. The Lord bless him. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. He even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. All right, so as widows, Naomi and Ruth go back to the land of Israel, and the Bible says they go in there around the time of the barley harvest, the first, you know, the initial stages, and that's about April or May. So they get there, and uh, they have a problem. The problem is that when Naomi and her husband left Israel to go to Moab, uh, the land, they kind of forsook the land that they had there. And now the husband could have reclaimed it, reclaimed it uh, or her son, or his sons, but all of them are dead. And so you have two widows that can't reclaim the land, and so they don't have a way to provide. Plus, no one would really do business with just a woman, right? It was all male to male. So they find themselves unable to work. And so the only provision that God in his wisdom gave to the, land of, to, to, to the country of Israel if you read in Leviticus in the Old Testament, it says, it tells the farmers, hey, when you are harvesting your fields, uh, whatever is left behind, you're going to leave it there. You're not going to pick it up. And it could be sometimes up to 20% of what they would harvest. It's like, don't pick it up. That is how the poor people and the foreigners, because the foreigners couldn't have land in Israel, the poor people and the foreigners are to make their living. So how are they going to gather? So, so the people that don't have lands or the people that come are not from here and can't, have, can't purchase lands, they're going to you know, make their living from what you drop, so don't pick it up. And so that's called gleaning. So Ruth says, I'm going to have to go work and glean, you know, of these, these, these fields. And, and I love this part because so the Bible says, and it just happened to be. It just, you know, lightly mentions it. It happens to be the fields of Boaz, one of their relatives. It's like God in the background is working, and I don't know how Ruth chose that field, but she ends up in this field, and she gleans, and he is a, in a, a man of upstanding character and says, you know, he could have said, like many others, he could have said, you're a Moabite woman. I don't want you, you know, roaming around here. You've caused so much destruction to the people of Israel. You Moabites, all you are is trouble. You know, go away. But instead, he remembers the, the, the law, Moses, and says, 
you're welcome to. You want to glean here? You're welcome. And then, again, a small town, right? Small village. He's like, I've heard that you left Moab to be faithful. To, you showed kindness to your mother-in-law. And he decides to show kindness to her in return. And just a small acts of kindness start weaving this story that God is, you know, just kind of just creating in the background. And so let's see what happens next. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you, where you will be well provided for. Now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true, I am a guarding redeemer of our family. There is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guarding redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, No one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. Bring me your shawl. You are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, Well, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. All right. So here we are, uh, chapter 3. And I love what Tim Mackey says about this. Uh, he's the guy from uh, uh, the Bible Project. You know, he says, this is where the story gets a little sticky, right? So what's going on with, you know, Ruth? And you're going in the middle of the night to lay at Boaz's feet. You know, it almost makes a good soap opera, right? Right here in this section. But here's what's happening. Um, so the problem that they had as widows is that, you know, they couldn't reclaim the land that belonged to Naomi's husband. And so one of the things that they needed is they needed a redeemer. God had made a provision for that. So you could have a close relative, the closest relative to that man that had died, the, the, the owned the, the land. And that redeemer could pay a redemption price and rebuy the land. But here's the thing. God knew that some people would want the land but didn't want to take care of the widows. And so God said, if you recover the land, you have to take care of the widows. And so that's basically what the commitment was. And it had to be a willingness, you know, a willing commitment from the person. And so that's where they find themselves. But in the midst of all this, here's my favorite part of this book. And this is kind of where it's reaching the climax. You see this woman that has been beaten by life, that has lost her husband and her sons, that has come back now to live in poverty in the land of Israel, left Israel you know, looking for something better and has come back to Israel just to live in poverty. And in the midst of all this, someone shows kindness to her, her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And then Boaz shows kindness to both of them. And all of a sudden, little by little, it says that by this time, it was the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. So it's been about six months, you know, plus whatever time they were in Moab, you know, as widows. So it's been a long period of time. Through all this, God keeps showing her kindness, little bits of kindness. And here's what I love, that Naomi finally 
gets a glimpse of hope once again. How do we know that? Because all of a sudden, he tells, she, tells, uh, she tells Ruth, you know what? You need, to, you need to change that mourning clothes that you have of widow because they would have a specific clothing for widows. It's like, you need to change out of that and let's move you on with your life. You need to find a family. You need to find a husband, someone who will provide for you. And Naomi tells, she's, tells her to go wash up, clean up, put perfume, put the best dress, you know, clothes that you have, and go and lay at Boaz's feet. Now, it sounds a little creepy, right? Can you imagine like having someone like laying at your feet right in the middle of the night? But it's just a tradition, right? And so basically what she was doing is she was saying, put your blanket over me. In other words, become our protector, become our redeemer. And so Boaz is willing, but we have another character, an unnamed character. It says there's another relative who is actually a closer relative than I am. Will he redeem them or will he let Boaz do it? Let's finish reading this, this passage. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer had mentioned. He came along. Boaz said, Come over here and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and asked them to sit down, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative, Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you, in the presence of these, stated here, of these seated here, and in the presence of the elders of my people, if you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. He said, I will redeem it. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transition, transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Imelech, Kilion, and Malon. I've also acquired Ruth, the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family and from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you, and by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. Then did a good job. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you guys helping with this. Um, so what do you think? This is, this is the story, right? It's, it's just, we need, to, we need to ask ourselves a question. Why is this story in the Bible? Why is this story in the Bible? Is this just a story, a love story that is beautiful? Or is this a story of tragedy turned to blessings? Well, you know, you, you have to argue for that as well. The reality 
is that this is a story that shows us God working in the back row and using people's faithfulness in different ways. Um, and, and maybe when you look at the story, it's like looking at a macro shot, right? It's like you're looking at it right here until the very end. You know that part where the genealogies go where you kind of stop paying attention and you're like, oh yeah, uh, what are we doing for lunch today? Like that very end of the story where you kind of checked out, that's actually the story that, that, that tells you, that connects the God story to the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. Because it, it turns out, as it turns out, this is a story that tells you how God was interweaving the life of David already before he was born. And that was important to the people of Israel. But now as Christians, we know that in this time of chaos, in the judge, you know, during the time of judges, it was a time of chaos. There was no ruler, no king. God was already planning to bring David as king. But not only that, through the lineage of David, he was already planning to bring another king. And we know of King Jesus. And so God was interweaving the stories of these people that showed kindness to one another to create a greater story. So even in the midst of chaos, tragedy, and bitterness, God is working in our lives, even when we don't see it. And, and so we are in that same situation today. God uses people's faithfulness as raw material to weave his faithfulness throughout our lives. And so we need to understand that every time that you're faithful, you are just giving God raw material to interweave his faithfulness into your story and into the story of other people. This is the story, Ruth, is the story about a bunch of little everyday decisions. You know, there's famine in the land. Do we go? Do we stay? You know, my husband died. My sons died. What do we do at that point? You know, what do we do when tragedy hits us? How do we react to it? You know, do I stay with my mother-in-law or do I go? As Boaz, do I let this woman, Moabite, that may give me a bad reputation, you know, stay because that's what God's telling me to do, or do I just shoo her away? They had to make a bunch of little decisions. You're looking at life right here like a macro shot. But what God was doing is every time they decided to show faithfulness and kindness, God was interweaving his faithfulness and his kindness in it. One of the parts that I love is there at the end, the women told Naomi, that her daughter-in-law, Ruth, had loved her. And this word she uses, they use is the word chesed. It's like, like, you're, like you have something in your throat. It's like an H sound, but you have something in your throat like chesed. And that word just means faithful love or committed love, a kindness that comes from the willingness, you know, the goodwill of someone towards someone else, whether it's God towards man or us towards God or to someone else. And it's that kind of love that God uses. And so we need to be able, we need to make sure that, that we are showing chesed to one another. That we're showing chesed to, to God. It is that faithfulness that he uses. So the question that I want to leave you with is this. Who did you relate with the most in this story? Because I want you to know regardless of who that is, God was using their faithfulness, their chesed to uh, interweave his story within their stories. If you think about Naomi, maybe you relate to Naomi. You know, has tragedy struck your life at times? Does it seem like what you hoped for your life didn't come out to be, you know, what you expected? Does it seem like maybe, you know, just it seems like one thing after another is happening to you? And you're like, God, where are you in all this? Like, and you feel a little bit of bitterness. Maybe for you it's, it's Ruth, you know, the outsider. The Moabite woman was the outsider. She was looked down upon. You know, people had, you know, just prejudice against her. She was unprotected, an unprotected person. You know, someone who, in spite of all that was working against her, was very bold. And she was as bold as to end up at Boaz's feet in the middle of the night, in spite of what people could say about her, because she knew she had to serve and provide for her and her mother-in-law. Or maybe you relate to Boaz, you know, that, that one man that maybe has seen his best years already in the past. He's looking back and he's like, man, my best years are already behind me. Maybe he didn't feel that attractive anymore. Remember what he tells Ruth? It's like, you didn't go after young men, whether rich or, or poor. It's like, 
you, you, you stuck with me. It's like he doesn't see himself as attractive. He's a hardworking man that has built a reputation in Israel, a man of upstanding character. Is that guy that does the right thing over and over and over again, or that gal that just, you know, just they do the right thing 10,000 times, and that builds a lifetime of, of just rep, a, rep, a good reputation. So who do you identify with most? The reality is God, God used Naomi's patience to be able to stay with them and to go back to the land of Israel in spite of the tragedies that had happened to continue to seek God. He used Ruth's, you know, just act of kindness to stay with his, her mother-in-law. And he used Boaz, just really good, upstanding character to be able to redeem these two women who were unprotected. The reality is that God is able to redeem whatever is going on in our lives, to weave tragedies with goodness, to lift us up and out of the, the macro shot of life that we experience every day, where we only see bitterness or happiness, and to see that he's interweaving both to create a greater story, a story that doesn't involve you only, but involves those around you. And when we can do that and know that, we need to understand that he can turn what's bitter into something sweeter in life. Some, some of the circumstances that we find ourselves that are hard and painful into something that will be beneficial and that will have a purpose down the line. And when we understand that, then we can in turn be faithful and be better for his glory. So at this point, we're going to take communion. And communion is something that we do here at Harvester every week. Uh, if you don't have a communion cup, we have some in the back, and Pat is going to go get some. If you need one, just raise your hand. But here's what we do. Uh, during this time of communion, I just want you to ask a couple of questions. And ask the Lord, God, what are you doing with both the good moments in life and the difficult moments that I'm experiencing right now? See, we just uh, celebrated Thanksgiving, right? So it's a time to be grateful, a time to be thankful. The reality is that these times also bring the painful moments in life. I don't know about you, but maybe there's people that has been lost, people that aren't with us anymore. Maybe there are circumstances that you wish to be better. It's like, God, I want to be grateful, but also I have a lot, you know, that I still need. Whatever it is that you're in, whatever place you're, you're in, I want you to ask, God, what is it that you are interweaving in my life through the good and through maybe the painful, through the sweet moments that I receive and through the better moments that I receive in my life. And as you do that, just spend some time just thanking him for the ability that he has to interweave both of them and to make our stories be part of his story. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, 